Yes, hello. I'm Gary Webster. So I'm the Heritage Officer for the Changing Chalk Project, uh, which is a kind of large uh, partnership project, landscape scale, um, with, which, which is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, the People's Postcode Lottery and the Limbury Trust. Uh, the National Trust are the lead partners on the project. Um, we've got kind of buy-in from a few local councils, um, the South Downs National Park Authority, um, Eastbourne and Lewis, uh, Brighton and Hove, and uh, yeah, there's there's about 20 partners in all, and we've been working with with others to help deliver on on some of the aspects. So what I'm going to do today is just talk a, a little bit, give a kind of brief overview of the project, uh, very brief because there's absolutely tons to it, um, and talk about how we've been kind of working with volunteers in all the kind of different aspects. So the change short project areas, we can see uh, Eastbourne in the east, and it goes to kind of Shoreham over in the west. Uh, it includes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of chalk downland, most of it, but it also includes uh, the cities of Brighton, in, uh, towns of Eastbourne, and then the coastal towns, Seaford, Peacehaven, Newhaven, uh, and Lewis too. So it is a kind of large, um, large landscape and large project area. Uh, but because we're working with so many partners, it's kind of made it a bit bit more manageable. As I say, complete opposite end of the, the country, uh, well, uh, of Britain to the, the previous one. I wish I put more competing lands sweeping landscape shots in. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, here we go. Um, so the main aim of the project is not kind of like an archaeological one but actually an ecological one and it's about the uh, chalk grassland which is a, a globally rare habitat um, and unfortunately since the 1940s we've lost about 80 percent of it uh, and this is through kind of urbanization and changing uh, farming practices um, it is known as the kind of tropical rainforest of um, of, of England, and that's because you can have such a density of species in a single square meter. Um, and it's what's worth knowing about this this kind of habitat is the fact that um, we do have things on chalk grassland that can only exist on chalk grassland. There is ecologies that only exist; um, it, it it can't exist anywhere else. Uh, where it exists now, it's kind of fragmented. You could see it's in uh, it's in the orange there and it's actually on um we'd find it now on very steep slopes uh, and that's basically just because it hasn't been plowed over uh, historically so that's what saved it from from being um from being destroyed um so the aim of the project through a variety of different ways is to kind of uh, regenerate this chalk grassland and kind of get it back together but we're, we're doing that through a kind of variety of themes. Um, the, the, the chalk grass that remains is, is you know, is, it does support lots and lots of, of, of different species of, of plants and animals. And uh, it isn't something that you can rewild to. So you can't just say, oh, we'll just leave this, this area now and it'll, it will turn back into chalk grassland. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. It is something that needs to be managed now uh, to preserve it. So Change Your Chalk has kind of three themes. Um, obviously, being the kind of archaeologist heritage officer, I work in the hearts and histories of the Downs, and I'll be discussing a few of those projects in a little bit more detail. But there is a really kind of wide array of projects. Um, uh, greening the cities, that is basically about kind of creating chalk grassland or chalk grassland type habitats in places that people can get to more easily. So that's connecting Downs and Towns, which is... It tries to do just that, get people out and about on the downs. Unfortunately, there does seem to be quite a large amount of people who, despite the fact that they maybe live in England, uh, Eastbourne, uh, which is really on the doorstep of the downs, they don't go up there. They've never been up there. You know, you get 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and they've never been up on the downs in their entire life. And this is something we're trying to, we're trying to bridge that gap, talk to these communities, find out why they're not going up there, and try and get them up there. Um, this isn't just for, uh, you know to have more involvement or get their kind of help volunteering, but really for kind of the mental health benefits that getting out and about uh, outside can help. Um, you know, and it, and we have seen in conversations with people that it does really really help people uh, with their, who are struggling in some ways. In fact, we've got some projects uh, such as um, growing new roots, which is all about 
um, people who have maybe some kind of difficulties about getting them out and, out and about on the downs and they do report that they, they kind of feel a lot better after doing the program. Uh, there's other projects like Find Your Future, which is uh, again in the connecting downs and towns. And that's about uh, getting young people that are in a kind of countryside uh, skills program. So they'll do things like uh, do style building with some National Trust Rangers. Um, they'll do kind of reptile surveys. They'll be doing a whole variety of things. Uh, such as they come out with me on, on some of the projects that I'm about to, about to mention. And there's, of course, restoring chalkland biodiversity, which is probably the, the kind of key theme. Uh, and that is really just about uh, getting these, these rare bits of chalk grassland kind of patched back together through a, a variety of different ways. So, yeah, there's... Um, as I said, uh, we, we're also working with landowners, uh, the Rathfinney estate, which is like a wine producer, um, load of different farmers um, to try and uh, make sure they understand the importance of uh, chalk grassland. Uh, also getting young people out on farm schools, uh, farm, farm visits, um, which has been really successful. And we've also been um, creating opportunities through apprenticeships and uh, young people's placements uh, to give people kind of like some experience in, in doing what we're doing. Uh, ecotherapy, health and wellbeing activities. We're thinking about access by having things like trampers that you can see in the uh, top right there available for people to use. Um, and we're also uh, trying to work with some kind of marginalised communities, such as the gypsies and travellers. In the bottom left-hand side, you can see a, a gypsy cob horse, which has been forged by people from that community and volunteers uh, to act as kind of like a, a lasting um, monument of, of the impact that these people have had uh, of, in the landscape. So... The first project that I'm going to talk about is, is one of the ones that I lead on, uh, it's Monument Mentors. It does sound very like, kind of similar to some of the stuff that Oculus Scotland has been doing. Um, so we've got about 227 scheduled monuments in the Changing Chalk area. Um, lots of those are kind of barrows and barrow cemeteries. Uh, a lot of things that I'm on speaking to people, they walk past, walk over frequently and didn't really know what it was or, or, or their, their significance. Um, unfortunately, lots of these uh, scheduled monuments haven't been kind of monitored or looked at probably in over 10 years, and this is something that we're trying to address. So we're trying to get people to engage with the heritage around them, uh, kind of get invested in, in what they see and, and pass regularly, and build a kind of network of volunteers to, to go and have a look at these, these monuments. There's... We've, we've developed um, toolkits uh, which are available online. So if you have go to the Change of Short website, uh, Monument Mentors, you can download these toolkits. They're available for, for everyone to use. Uh, so, um, yeah, they, they don't, it doesn't just have to be down on the, on the South Downs that they're appropriate. And these have been developed alongside uh, Historic England and the, the South Downs National Park. Um, and so what we're trying to do in this first instance with the level one is just to get people to kind of go out, have a look at the monuments, have a look at the damage agents and report on those damage agents. The um, and, you know, Things like kind of if there's been metal detecting or bonfires and stuff like that. We'll, we'll have a look at a few examples of that in a, in a second. Um, this data ends up on the Missing Pieces project, uh, which is the Historic England website. Um, you know, you have to sign up through that, and that's a, you know, it's, it's accessible to everyone. Everyone can get a login and and start contributing to this. Um, so once you've got the toolkit and and it explains what you need to do, you can go out find the find the scheduled monuments near you and and go and have a crack of it. Crack at it. You don't need to be part of a a kind of whole whole community doing it. It is something you can do by yourself. However, we do find that people do like the aspect, the social aspect of being. Of, uh, as you know going out as part of a group so uh it does go into kind of more detail about some things like it describes how to do like a sketch plan 
uh, to, to identify when there's problems. And on the left-hand side there, you can see the kind of uh, written report which is generated for each trip to the monuments, uh, describing, you know, is it overscrubbed or um, is there kind of erosion or, or, or animal burrowing, etc. There's also the level two. Uh, the level two goes into a lot more kind of uh, a lot more in depth of t as to the, the monuments. So you do your own research. You um, this is where we kind of want people to to really start adopting the monuments in a kind of similar uh, fashion as to what we heard previously. Uh, people to go out regularly and inspect the monuments maybe every six months to see if there's any damage agents, or more regularly if they're nearby and walking past. Um, once you get to know the monument and you've seen it a few times, you'll know exactly what to look for, you know where to look, uh, just getting comfortable with the monument and, and kind of developing your own, your own relationship, really. Um, there's also a whole lot of resources so you can do much further research um, onto it. I mean, these are all kind of publicly accessible resources. It's just kind of bringing them all into one place. Um, and this is a way that people can kind of generate their own, their own projects, their own interest and... I think this is something that we really need to consider when we think about the longevity of a project, the legacy of a project. Um, you know, when you have projects uh, that have someone in post, like me, example, for this one, I'm not going to be here, here forever. You know, I've got a set projects period. We need to think about what happens afterwards. We don't want people vo who volunteer to be left kind of homeless without knowing what to do, that they can do things by themselves without generating their own network. So this is really where we're trying to kind of get people to join other societies, uh, you know, go out in groups or, or you know, just generate small, smaller, you know, smaller groups themselves to, uh, to have a look at the areas that interest them. So these are just a couple of photos that we've taken recently, obviously on the right hand side, uh, someone's been having a, a party up on a on a Bronze Age barrow, um, which is unfortunate. You know, bonfire damage. Uh, so this has been used really to historic England have seen this, and they've they've asked us to go back out there and keep an eye on it, and kind of use it as a case study. To how long does this take to kind of naturally repair if if no one if no one does does anything about this? Uh, what else is going to be up there next time you go up there? And in fact, I think last time we went up to this uh, barrow on the on the right hand side, there was also signs of metal detecting damage as well, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, the bottom left hand side, we can see this is probably foot erosion where people have gone up to the trig point, which is on top of a Bronze Age barrow, which is unfortunate, but uh, you know it does happen. There was also a whole lot of um, motorbike tracks, like dirt bike tracks, all around there, where people have been going kind of crazy on a dirt bike. Um, which is, you know, unfortunate. Luckily, it's generally kind of superficial damage, and it's it's it is something that will kind of naturally heal. It wasn't too kind of invasive, not like some of the kind of metal detecting damage. The top left hand side was a bit of an arty shot that I took of um, uh, all the people standing on the the, the Bronze Age uh, barrows in a kind of small cemetery. Actually, I think some of those are actually kind of Saxon ones. But I just got my my volunteers just to kind of stand where there was. Uh, some of the previously identified um, uh, barrows just so I could take this nice shot. But what we actually got uh, when we were up there this time, um, I think it's pretty much where I've taken the photo from, there was another barrow which actually had a modern cremation that someone had left on top of it along with a kind of stone uh, saying, you know, like in memorial for someone. I mean, I contacted uh, the a local kind of police um, heritage crime officer about is this a crime? What do we do about that? And he, he kind of got back to me. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. He's asking his, um, asking his, uh, his superiors, what do we do in this instance? And it was like, I think we'll just kind of leave, leave it as it is and uh, come back to it and see how it is in a couple of months. Um, but yeah, it's reuse of a, a Bronze Age barrow in, in 2024. But there we go. So there's also projects called, uh, this one's called The Big Dig. Uh, this one was focused in Eastbourne, and this was really about getting to people to uh, excavate in their back gardens, effectively. So I think we had 50 different people sign up to this one. But this one was led by uh, Heritage Eastbourne, who's one of the partners on the project, by the way. Um, they uh, yeah had over 50 people sign up to dig uh, test pits in their uh, back gardens, 
uh, and in some public places, so it was accessible for people who had gardens and people who didn't, uh, so they could attend the kind of public excavations. And this is really where we're trying to bring the volunteering opportunities to people. You know, you don't need to travel to do this um, if, if you can do it in your back garden. Uh, and we had archaeologists on hand if you encountered something or you didn't know how to do something. We had kind of like a team of flying archaeologists to go out and, and lend assistance um, and see how they were getting on with their test bits, etc. cetera. Um, this was all about trying to develop um, an understanding of, of what is a of how did Eastbourne develop as a kind of uh, that, a downland settlement um, by just taking this massive kind of a snapshot through all the different areas of Eastbourne. And uh, there was some, was some quite interesting finds. Uh, we've got some of the kind of uh, people who come through the NEETS program, so not in education, employment or training. Um, this is where it's part of the Find Your Future uh, thing that I mentioned earlier on. So this is kind of, you know, people who maybe haven't uh, engaged with things, maybe it gives them a chance to try new things, find what interests them. Uh, and as a result of this Find Your Future program, I've actually got some people who've been coming out with me very regularly to uh, monitor monuments and in engage with some of the other activities we're doing. So the Downs from Above project is... Uh, this is where we've had Historic England mapping 190 square kilometres of um, archaeology from aerial photos and LIDAR surveys over thousands of sources, uh, different photographs from, you know, hundreds of years ago, well, 100 years ago, I should say, obviously. Uh, the earliest ones being uh, from the kind of RAF from kind of 1940s. Um, the... Yeah, there's like a mosaic of sources and they've they've mapped all the archaeology that we can see. So that they've been able to identify. Obviously, a lot of this has been kind of built over in the in the meantime. Uh, some of it's been destroyed. Some of it has has probably been um, uh, gone over over the cliffs, etc. Um, but a lot of it is still there to visit. And this is another thing that we've we're using to try and engage people. Uh, this is you know this is something that people can do from their the, the comfort of their own home they can um contribute to this data they they can talk about when they've been out there before they can add resources add things that they know it doesn't have to be monitoring data about the conditions of um about the conditions of monuments it doesn't have to be you know scientific data it can be their memories it can be their thoughts and feelings on a place so this is on uh, if you google change your chalk down from above you'll get this publicly accessible kind of platform that you can have a look at all the data and and uh, explore what, what's been mapped this is going to also it's on the aerial archaeology map and explorer as well and it's going to remain there so it'll be will be a kind of lasting lasting piece of the project um it has indeed uh, generated some new, uh, several new features that we didn't know about, such as on the right hand side, you can see the uh, Barrow Cemetery, the kind of larger um, features on the, at the bottom, uh, which was unknown before. So, you know, because there's been lots of World War II activity with tanks, there's been lots of, uh, there's been a golf course there. They they weren't sure what this was, but after, after this, kind of program they've been able to identify that it was actually a kind of barrow cemetery and indeed it's just to the south of the south downs way so in a completely publicly accessible place i mean the south downs way is effectively touching one of those uh one of those barrows there um and when you go out there went out there using a kind of gps we found that there was there was you know uh, maybe 20 30 centimeters difference you could just kind of figure it out it is accessible on your kind of phones uh and there we go on the left-hand side, uh, using it out in the field, and you can add data straight to it. Uh, so we did have a project um, that was actually started by one of the um, the NEETs, so a, a young person uh, who's interested in his local history. He's interested in Wild Park in Brighton, uh, somewhere where he spent a bit of time. Um, and basically we're using the downs from above data that you can see mapped on the right hand side to go and kind of have a look at the historic landscape. He'd already done lots of kind of uh, research online and he kind of took us out and led us on a walk. Um, 
which is you know really quite impressive for someone who's only kind of 16 years old so uh yeah they, they did very well and they uh we really appreciate that them taking the time to kind of show us the the sites that interest them and we could kind of identify several of the kind of features which are um that have been mapped try and figure out what they are so this is just one of the ways that we're kind of doing things a bit differently non-intrusive just you know um heading through the kind of park through the woods to find to find things that maybe have been lost there was also a whole program of training um that we've been doing as well and this i think this is people really appreciate um having the chance to kind of upskill like this and appreciate the kind of uh chance to get kind of a bit more of an education um We've got a kind of flint workshop on the right-hand side, how to identify it, et cetera. On the bottom left-hand side, this was part of uh, Historic England providing some um, geophysics training. And then on the top left, uh, the top left, we were out in the field at Beachy Head doing some, some geophysics with the, the volunteers. And the volunteers, I think, uh, some of them are becoming so competent now that they could actually lead their own uh, kind of excavations and stuff like that. Um, some of the kind of challenges we've had um, with, the, with the program, we're trying to engage young people. Um, you know, getting out and about to places is difficult for young people if you don't drive. Driving is, to learn to drive now, is prohibitively expensive. Um, it's, it, if you're going to do something with volunteers, you really need to be able to um, organise transport, especially when you're thinking about younger people, uh, because the chances are then they're not going to be able to uh, drive themselves just because they wouldn't have, maybe wouldn't be able to afford it afforded it especially when you're thinking about the kind of demographics uh, and the kind of people that you're trying to get in um you know people from maybe more socially deprived areas which is something we try to do as part of this um project also what you need to consider is um you really need to work with the kind of groups that you want to engage with from the offset uh, and figure out what they would like to, to work on and what would interest them. Maybe don't come in with a kind of fully fledged, fledged project design and say, you know, you can be part of this uh, if you want, um, take it or leave it kind of thing. The, uh, the final thing really is about, you know, we, we're seeking to engage kind of a broad, broad audience uh, you know, get as many people as we can up on the downs, volunteering in the vast array of projects that we've got going. But we, we want to focus on the people that are hard to reach. But really, you know, we should be maybe thinking that as the as the National Trust, as these big bodies, maybe we're the ones that are kind of hard to reach, you know, to the people that, um, to, to the, the, the person who doesn't engage, it's because they don't see that, you know, we're there, we're approachable and stuff like that. And that's something that we, we you know, we need to work on as a, as a kind of organization and, and generally across the entire kind of heritage community, I think. Um, also, we need to kind of really value that people who do come and volunteer, they're not in the same boat as us a lot of the time. You know, they're giving up their personal time. Um, and I think that it's so refreshing when we find... Uh, a kind of young person and really tap into the enthusiasm that they've got, you know, just bubbling beneath the surface and just give them an outlet to, you know, experience something for the first time, show how enthusiastic they are and really, you know, get them the chance to, to learn something new. And it's been, it's been very, very re rewarding. And uh, I'm looking forward to another two years of the project. Um, and I really hope that we can kind of leave a lasting legacy. We don't leave um, a kind of lot of, kind of homeless volunteers at the end of it. So this is something that I'm really going to be looking for, uh, looking at in the next couple of years. Thank you.